Okay, good morning. So, this morning I'm going to talk about two... Uh, This morning, I'm going to talk about uh, two papers, two things I have done with some of my colleagues in the last year. The first one is about security. So we want to know what's wrong in our network. The network is the network of the University of Pisa. The University of Pisa is uh, probably the, the only Italian university that owns fibers that uh, run across the town. So it's possible to do basically whatever we want because we own the fibers. And uh, the network is based uh, on modern Juniper switches. And the problem we are facing is the following. The bandwidth, the internet bandwidth is not available. My colleagues augmented the bandwidth, they had more bandwidth, and then the bandwidth has been used completely in a couple of days. So basically, the solution is not to increase the bandwidth, but the solution is to find out what is not working there. Not working in terms of bandwidth usage, and not working in terms of attacks, so if there is something wrong. So today, I'm going to show you the implementation and the design of a system that allows us to identify machines that don't, don't, don't behave like we expect. So basically, the goal of this work is to do this. The assumption is that in every network there are some variables that don't change significantly. And if you are able to, to identify those variables, if you are able to track those variables over the time, then you are able also to find anomalies. Anomalies means something that deviates from what we believe is normal. It's very simple to, to find uh, a an, an network IDS, install it, and run it. But we have seen that those systems have uh, severe limitations. First of all, they know some patterns. So if they recognize the pattern, the system works. If the system does not recognize the pattern and there is something wrong, the system doesn't say anything. In addition, we have uh, false positives that are really annoying after a while. Because if you receive a lot of messages every day saying, I'm, this is something wrong, this is something wrong, this is something wrong, and you go there and you realize that it was not really a problem. Okay? Then the day after you say, okay, this item is not reliable, so let's keep this host, let's keep this host, and then at the end you will not end up using it, honestly. So basically anomaly detection systems, as I said, flag server activities that deviate from the normal behavior. So basically we don't, we don't need in this case a prior knowledge uh, uh, of the intrusion, but also the disadvantage are that we don't have a clear definition of the attack. And uh, therefore, we have decided to create a new anomaly detection system. As I said, we performed various experiments. Thanks to this, uh, to this router, we have the ability to monitor uh, several variables, simply creating some firewall filters that on the Juniper can do an action. For instance, drop the packet, count the packet, forward the packet to another interface, or count the packet in a way that it can be exported via SNMP. So we have done two things. First of all, we have counted the packet, and secondly, we have exported the packet towards another machine that is connected to a mirror port for a better analysis, okay? Just to find out what's wrong. And uh, you see, look at this curve. This has been generated with uh, MRTG. It's very simple to find some similarities, but if we look at uh, a simple variables like the traffic or the packets, will end up having a lot of false positives because the traffic uh, um, cannot be expressed in terms of those, of those variables. Many people say, okay, we look at the traffic. If there is too much traffic, there is an attack. Might be. But it also might be that uh, today Italy is playing against France, you know, and everybody is looking at the web. Or it might be that somebody has a multicast transmission. So those variables are definitely not reliable. If you want to have a lot of alarms, then use them. But if you want to do something better, you don't need to use them. Because, you know, you cannot simply say, okay, a lot of traffic, this is a peak, a problem. It does not mean that. So this is what we want to say. So basically, we decided to investigate whether it was possible to identify some traffic parameters that can be profitably be used for identifying problems, problem number one. And then 
you know, define some rules so that when we violate some of the, those uh, parameters, there is a problem. This, this work goal. So basically, what is an anomaly for us? First of all, we have studied the, the RFCs, and we try to identify something that from the standard point of view, it is not correct. So if you have an RFC, you know how the way and shaking is working. If somebody is trying to violate that, there is a problem. Okay? It might be that this machine has a problem with the IP stack, but this is not the case, but it is probably a violation. Somebody is trying to send probe packets or something that shouldn't work like that. And second, we want to have some sort of static, uh, dynamic knowledge, okay? Because as I've said, the traffic analysis changes according to the network characteristics, and every network has a different uh, curve, okay? So the first one can be basically used by everybody, and this one has to be tuned in every network to see what's wrong. For instance, just to make an example, we have some machines, we know. Okay. Uh, we, have, uh, we have some machines, and if we count the number of SIM packets on this, on this machine, and we compare them with the number of connections open, so we compare the ratio of the SIM with the ratio of the open connection, we see that on some machines we have some numbers, on other machines we have other numbers. For instance, um, our web server okay, has usually a ratio close to one to one. Okay, if you see a SIM, you will probably end up having a connection. If you have a peer-to-peer -peer server, so or a machine that is sharing files, this is not the case because most of the time there are at attempts to open connection either towards you or from you towards the rest of uh, the internet. So those variables have to be tuned, as I said, dynamic knowledge according to what we want to do. So the static knowledge, the static knowledge has been derived basically looking at first of all known network security violations. So we have an history, the recent history, either locally, because we have been attacked, of course, or because other people had similar problems. And this can be a good starting point. Second, we want to dissect the IP protocol to see how it works and to find out if there is something wrong. Okay? Third, we want to also to, to keep track of some parameters, uh, some thresholds that are monitored <coughs> by commercial uh, products or RFCs, like Armon, for instance. The size of the packet, the packet should fall into certain uh, categories and so on. And of course, the most important one, we've done a survey of the parameters that are checked by network administrators. Because everyone has his own experience, okay? And you know that in your life you probably start checking the things that you know can be a cause of a certain problem. So this was very important. And for dynamic knowledge, we want to, first of all, list the, the network services we provide, okay? And we want to create some thresholds, but that are not simple. It means that they are the intersection of several things, like the same packet ratio, so then uh, what I've said before, uh, number of concurrent outgoing connections. So if there is a machine that has many outgoing connections, then either this machine is infecting the internet, or this machine is providing a lot of files, or there is something wrong, okay? So at least we can say that this machine is suspicious, but if you know that this machine, for instance, is a mail server, then you can say, okay, it might be that this is okay. But if this machine is not a mail server, or doesn't fall into some categories that we know are fine, then we have to investigate, because there is something that is probably worth check. I don't have a lot of time to describe everything, but these are some common traffic parameters. Okay? We cannot, for instance, simply measure the number of SIM packets. They don't, see, they don't say much. Okay? But if I match this number with the number of connection, I can say a lot. And of course, if you do this on a global network, okay, you don't see a lot of problems. Because if you have, like in our case, a class B network, and you count the number of SIM, the number of connections, you don't know whether there is still a problem. And if there is a problem, you don't know where the problem is. So we have to do this per host, or at least per the important host. And in our experience, we have realized that most of the attacks are not coming from, from the important host, but from machines that have left 
somewhere in the, in the corner, not updated, not nothing, and the attacker attacks those machines, and then the problem starts. So, first of all, we know we are protecting the servers, but this is not enough. We definitely have to protect also those machines. And because it is not our responsibility to protect machines that are on the corner, and as I said, we are in the center, we must make sure that at least we, we send an email to some uh, local administration saying, hey, look, we believe that there is something wrong with your machine. Please check it. So basically, the validation is the following. In Pisa, we used to have an ATM backbone, and this is a picture from a couple of months ago when uh, we have done the validation. The, the system is, is working. Uh, I will show you later. We have this box, this Juniper box, that, uh, as I said, counts. Okay? So we access the counters using SNMP or something called JunoScript that's basically an XML RPC based uh, software that's provided uh, with every box. And uh, we have the internet link and here there is the traffic we are interested in. And we forward this traffic towards one application I have developed named Entop for further analysis. Because with the Juniper box, you can do a lot. But, for instance, you can count the number of SIM packets, but you cannot count the number of connections. Because then you, you must follow the TCP IP uh, implementation. You can say, okay, this is a connection. This was an attempt. That's very different. So basically, is, this is what we have today. Uh, at the moment, ATM has been replaced with MPLS and 1 gig Ethernet. And this is the, the box that is going to the internet towards with a uh, 100 megabit link connection. Uh, mrtg.unip.it, this is the site. If you see, we have put uh, three little icons on the Juniper box that tell us something about this box. The most interesting one is probably the third one. I'm going to click it. So we periodically read the, the value of the counters into the Juniper box. This is software we have developed. We read those values, we save those values into an RRD database, and then we make some comparison and we send some alarm. For instance, this is, this is live data, as you can see, six, so this is more or less nine. And even if there are some attacks that we believe don't exist anymore, this is the proof that we're wrong. Attacks like this one, Smart and Fraggle, that should be, I don't know, something <laughs> for the literature. They are still working. Or for instance, you know, spoofing. This one is definitely an attack because this is a spoofed address packet. I don't want to, to tease you with, uh, with uh, spoofing, but uh, it, you know it, that if a packet is coming from the wrong interface, okay, this could, could be a problem. With Juniper, you can do a lot for dynamic uh, networks, okay, because it's very simple to do it with, for a static network. This is the network, this is the interface. If the packet is not coming from this interface, then there is a problem. But for multicast and other things, then you run into trouble if you don't have something dynamic. Here, for instance, packet to suspicious ports. What, are, what is a suspicious port for us? For instance, the printer. Is somebody allowed from the internet to print onto a local printer? No, there is something wrong, or X11, or whatever. So if you are able to, first of all, to draw, and second, to send those packets to a machine, like uh, the one we have that is running hand top, and to clearly identify the problem, we can go and say, here we have a problem. So if you want to, to enjoy, this is the site, mrtg.unip.it. OK, here we go. So basically, just to, to conclude, we believe that uh, this expected behavior that is basically the study of RFCs and the dynamic uh, uh, knowledge allows us to have a system that is more or less good for a longer time, okay? This one is effective even when we have a firewall because when you have a firewall, you don't have to think that you're safe, okay? Like when at home you have an alarm, you have to think everything is okay. And it's important because, for instance, if a cracker gains host access by means of a buffer overflow and then starts using your machine for doing something you don't expect, then your firewall will not detect that. But with this system, we have been able to detect many attacks, like uh, you know, a Trojan that's installed, and then this Trojan is spreading all around. If you count the number, as I said, 
of outgoing connection. And if we have a history of the number of outgoing connection for that machine, then we can say there is something okay that is worth to analyze. Basically, just to give you some figures, we have more or less 50 rules per host and 20 global rules. As I said, at the University of Pisa, we have a class B network. Okay, so we don't want to overload the Juniper with a lot of rules. Basically, we have 20 rules that apply to everybody, so to every machine that is going to and from the internet, and then the rest is sent to a local machine where we run on top and where we can really pinpoint the problems. Just to give you some feel about the false positives, on non hosts so on host that we know behave in a certain way, mm, for instance, the servers, our machines, or the, the, the core machines, the false positive rate is very low. But if the system says, oh, look, there is something strange worth to analyze on an unknown host, so those hosts that we don't really analyze every day, I cannot tell you this, uh, because basically we have to investigate. Because if this is a host that was not important for us, but at some point it goes on top of the list, then we must really have a look at it before saying there is an alarm. And basically for thresholds, we have some thresholds. So when those curves exceed some thresholds, then we have a problem. So as I said, we are the, at the core, so we are trying to monitor the important machines. So we have some thresholds for non-hosts. And if there is a new host and we find that there is something strange, we send an email to the network administrator of the, the network where this machine is installed and say, look, these are the figures. So either you, you tell us some thresholds and you ask those values are publicly available inside the network, you can use them and emit alarm yourself, or you can tell us whether this activity is correct or not. And the final thing, this allows us <coughs> to, first of all, optimize the bandwidth, because we have noticed that there are some machines that are really using the bandwidth very badly, so we have some optimization here. And uh, we have been able to detect the killers, network bandwidth killers, those systems that, I don't know, have thousands of files shared with peer-to-peer, -peer and that allow us to say, okay, you have to fix this. We have been able to identify protocols that we really want to see, like I said, LPR over the internet, printing over the internet, natural misconfiguration, and of course, unwanted server activity, something we think should happen here. That's all, as I said, if you want to see a live, live demo, this is the site. Thank you very much. There's a question over there. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned something about 50 uh, rules per host or 20 global rules. How long did it take you to uh, calibrate those rules to make uh, uh, right thresholds to not uh, have uh, many mis uh, misleading alarms, etc. Oh, okay, um, probably the word rule w was not correct. Um, uh, 20 or 50 things that we analyze. For instance, for me, as I said before, the number of outgoing connection compared to the number of SIM packets for me is, is a rule somehow. So, so, so yeah, it's something to draw. And then a threshold. It took quite a lot of time. And uh, I have to admit that uh, we never end up working with them because periodically there is a new protocol, okay, or periodically somebody installs something on the network and then the behavior, okay, the global behavior probably doesn't change much, okay. But the local behavior, if you have a host, the curve changes a lot, okay. So for the core hosts, let's say that. Uh, after a couple of weeks of observing those, those thresholds, we're more or less fine, okay? But those are machines that we control, so we don't install new software. On other machines, as I said, we generate uh, sort of alerts, we send them to the network state of the machine, and then it's their responsibility, because as I've shown you, we are in the center of the network. So it takes quite, quite some time for tuning, especially if you install and remove application, or if you have the HSP, so the the address changes, you cannot track the address, but you have to track the name. It's not easy, but for the core machines, two, three weeks is fine. Okay. Any other question? Thank you very much again. And yep. the next presenter will be also.
recovery. Okay, basically, this is a follow on to the previous presentation. Just to Oops. more or less, we have the same playground because we are here. So, the idea is the following here we are analyzing only a part of the traffic, okay? the one that goes to and from the internet. There are many people who are on the, on the backbone here, that as I said, it's running a gigabit at the moment here, one gig. You see they have other boxes. Okay. And those people need also to analyze their own local traffic because we only track the traffic that goes to from the internet. But also we would like to see the local traffic, what's happening here. And because we are here, we have to delegate this activity to other people. So we said, why don't we use NetFlow or Similaria to have some accounting, some figures, not only for detecting problems, but also for, the, for doing some accounting, say how the bandwidth is used, if there is something wrong, who has to pay, okay? If we have to announce this, this box, who is going to pay for it? Who are the most user? Is the technical department, uh, the engineering, the administration, and so on? So we said, let's use NetFlow. Everybody has accepted it as a standard, more or less. But with NetFlow, we have a problem. The boxes okay, are very fast, are able to switch millions of packets per second. But when they have to generate flows, I'm talking about Cisco, Stream, and Juniper, they are running into troubles. Because they are not able to cope with the network speed. They take a sub portion of the traffic probably around 10,000 10, packets per second, and they generate flows out of them. And this is a problem. So we are not happy because you can definitely use those flows for uh, having a, an idea of what's going on, but you cannot really do account. So we need a net, a net flow probe for a gigabit network. So that's why we decided to, to develop this. That is called NProbe. It's a software probe that you run onto a PC that receives traffic from a mirror port in our case, from a Juniper, but you can put a hub or whatever you want. Okay, of course, at Gigabit you have probably this facility, but you can tune the the switch to mirror you the traffic, and then to generate flows out of it. So as I've said, Cisco NetFlow is a commercial standard for network monitoring. Everybody knows it. Many companies say we are NetFlow aware, but more or less, this is just commercial stuff because, as I've said, they have they run into major traps. For instance. Juniper can handle up to 7,000 packets per second. Although the switch maybe is able to switch 1 million packets per second in your network. But only a sub sub portion of the traffic is used for generating flows. Everybody knows that if you turn on net NetFlow on Cisco's, basically the performance will go down. Or if you install these MSFC cards, you run into trouble with configuration. Okay, because probably some of them are really not able to operate in your network because you have a certain configuration that the car doesn't like, or you suggest a part of the traffic. So you know that on the internet there are many collectors available for NetFlow because the idea is that you have the router that sends you the flows. Okay. There is very, very little offering on the probe side. So there are not probes, basically, just a few of them. And uh, the problem is that NetFlow monitoring cannot cope with gigabit speed. And there is an alternative named SFlow that is becoming more and more popular. But the problem of has flow is that limited to a few um, companies, like best, um, basically just to foundry networks. Okay? And uh, S flow is good, but doesn't have um, everything that NetFlow offers uh, because it, it uses statistical and uh, packet sampling. Also, NetFlow is supported on high-end routers. So if you have a slow net, or if you have ADSL, if you have somebody that doesn't have a uh, high-end net uh, router, you cannot uh, enable NetFlow. And also, because of this, many people are still using MIP2. Okay? You run MRTG on the interface, you draw the graph, you see a peak, and then you say, why? 
you don't know, you don't have a clue, because this is aggregated information. R mount is, is relatively used <coughs> and very difficult probably to install and to use, and most of all, it's very expensive. So our solution was M Pro plus N Top. So basically, we want to be able to, to give NetFlow another chance, okay, to let it work for gigabit network without having to buy very expensive cars, because those MSFC cars cost thousands of uh, euros. We want to be able to run at gigabit speed, so at least one gig with no packet sampling. So if we do some packet sampling in future nets, so probably 10 gig, you can do 1 to 10, and you're fine. And we want to be able to have something really open source for everything. And top is open source, and probe is open source. So generate the flows and collect the flows open source. So the main features of Mprobe are, first of all, that it runs on both Unix and Windows. That's very important. Second, as I said, it's able to keep up a gigabit speed. And, and third, that it doesn't use a lot of CPU or a lot of memory. Okay? So we are able to have good results. So basically, just to give some figures about the internet. There's one main thread that receives packets and store them in a hash, okay? And there is another thread that periodically walks the table and emits expired flows. The hash is static because when we start, we want to know how much memory we need. And this is very important for embedded system. I'm going to show you later. So I start, I allocate the memory, and then I do everything with that memory. No malloc, no free at all. So we don't lose time with malloc and free. And we know that if we start, we're able to work. Of course, somebody may say, OK, but what about BGP? Inside NetFlow, you have information about the autonomous system. So the traffic is coming from this AS is going towards this AS. In order to solve this problem with uh, NPROBE at the moment, we're using a file. So we extract information out of our router. There are several scripts that allow you to do this with Cisco. They are on the internet. If you buy a Juniper, for instance, there are some demo scripts that via Juno script extract the BGP table. Somebody may say, OK, but the BGP table changes over the time. Yes. But I assume you don't want to monitor end to end AS, but you want, so the, the origin, but you want to monitor the peer. You want to see how in your network the traffic is flowing. Is it going towards provider one, provider two, or provider three? And the BGP table in your table probably doesn't change very often. Or even if it changes, you just have to extract it again from the router, save it into a file, and restart the problem. So we also have PGP information, although we are not inside the router. Very briefly, some figures about the performance. Those tests have been performed with an Agilent router tester, model 900. And uh, we use Linux, uh, dual Athlon 1.6 gig, uh, Intel Pro 1 gigabit Ethernet card, Normal Linux, no tuning, no nothing. We decided to use the drivers that are provided by Intel, not by Donald Becker. But that's a secondary issue. So basically, those are the figures. When we have a packet of random cell between 64 and 1,000 uh, bytes, we are basically able to run at full speed, 953,000 packets per second. When we have small packets, we run to travel at the moment. I I have not mentioned that this application is based on lib pickup. So basically, the packet is sent to the user space, collected, and we do something with that, like many stiffers and many other applications are doing. So their figures are great, because as I said, here, this is basically the maximum you can achieve out of one gigabit Ethernet. Okay? But if the packets are very small, then we probably have some troubles. Modern networks tend to have small packets. For instance, in telephony, okay, those cellular phones, they have small packets. So we have said, OK, those figures are great, but they, they are not what we want. They are not the final goal. This probe is perfect for many people. Okay? If you have a 100 megabit network, uh, you install it on a normal Pentium 2, Pentium 3, something. It doesn't use much memory, a few megabytes, 3, 4 megabytes. It depends how large is your network, and you are done. No major problems. With gig, we have some limitations. So we have decided to do something more. First of all, we have decided to create an embedded appliance for this. Because if you have your network, you probably are scared of having a PC, installing the software on it, 
and probably moving the PC to the place where you have to monitor the traffic, especially if you have small departments uh, of people like, uh, you know, they're not computer scientists. You don't want to give them a PC, a monitor, a cable, and they have to turn it on. You want to have a small appliance. So we have, we have work uh, at an embedded and probably applying name and box. I will show you some pictures now. On the other hand, we are not happy about the information that NetFlow is sending us. For instance, NetFlow doesn't say anything about MPLS or VLAN. If you have VLANs or MPLS, you don't have this information. No payload, and also we would like to have some sort of security, so know whether the flow we see is generated by us or by somebody else. The NetFlow count is not enough, of course. And of course, some compression. So these are the current research topic. And uh, just to give you some information about the, the availability, here you can find the probe, the software probe. We are now trying to create a version of the probe that runs inside the Linux kernel for better performance. So we already have some prototypes that are performing very well. So basically, we have moved the probe from the use space to the kernel space so we can run at full speed and we send to, uh, towards the user space the flows using a memory map, so some memory that is shared between the user space and the kernel. And we're achieving good numbers, good figures. Uh, so far we're able to, to, to go at full speed, so namely the, the limitation is the PC. Okay? It's not that we are wasting time copying packets, doing system calls. This is solved. The problem is the PC. So how fast it can handle interrupts? Okay, how fast the packets are arriving and this machine is able to, to handle it. Second, NBox, if you follow this link, you will find something like a cigarette box, as small as, small as this. It has two, two power PCs inside an embedded power PC, 800 series, that allows you to monitor slow network up to 10 megabit, megabit per second. And this is good for many people who have ADSL, for many people who don't have a fast connection, but even HDSL is fine. You can monitor it properly. So it, at the edge, you can generate flows that you will send to a central repository for doing your own monitoring. And this appliance is very cheap. And then at the end, if you want to visit this, uh, this site, nflow.org, you will see a specification of this new flow format we are now trying to push. Nflow at the moment is supported by Nprobe, so Nprobe is, is able to emit flows, both NetFlow and Nflow. If you go there, if you go to the site, you will see what's, what's interesting about Nflow, okay? Uh, why we have created it. As I said, we have information about the payload, we have some compression, we have some security, and most of all, we are able to support IPv6. NetFlow doesn't know anything about IPv6. If you have an IPv6 network, you cannot do accounting using NetFlow. And you're able to do this with this. As I said, it's supported by Mprop. That's all for now. What do you do with the collected information? Do you export to another station, another software, your software, or some common solution? Okay, of course you can use whatever collector you want. There are many available on the internet. So it's a standard approach. Yeah, but uh, we tend to use NTOP, and so NTOP is able to collect packets out of the internet, uh, the, uh, the adapter using pickup, but also to receive NetFlow probes, NetFlow flows. So, in our view, we want to provide both the probe and the collector. You seem to rely on um, on duplication of packets on a switch. Uh, that means you can't uh, handle all the other kinds of interfaces you could expect on a, on a router, like a POS interface. Like? Like a POS interface. Uh, it's not, this is not correct. Um, there is somebody from Jupyter that can explain you. One of the good features of this box is that it's able to monitor IP packets that are running on Sonnet, SDH, or ATM in our case, on an internet interface. So the, my probe is able to see those packets, although they're running 
on something that is not Ethernet. So in my example, I, I shown you ATM, OK? IP over ATM. My probe receives the packets, and this work is done by the router. Because if the router has to route ATM to Ethernet, then it has the knowledge of the IP packet. And we basically delegate this to the router. Just to give you some figures, with this approach, we have been able to monitor ATM. I don't have POS, but you can do exactly the same. Over the Ethernet, you attach the probe, and then you have whatever you have. Not important. Mm. This comes for free. Eh? Mm. It's, uh, it's an embedded. Uh, I, have a, I have a comment uh, regarding your, your uh, uh, statement that you cannot monitor IPv6 with the current NetFlow. Yes, you can if you use the, the version 9. Yeah, but, but, but uh, who's deploying version 9? Um, it, it's an approach to uh, a new NetFlow. And, and uh, for that one, uh, probably, uh, how is it related to the NFlow specification you have done mm -hmm. to the IP fix uh, working group of IATF? Yeah, but uh, I, I agree with you. But there are two problems. OK, first of all, NetFlow v9 is not deployed. OK? Yes. You have, OK. The second, you don't have free collectors. People that are uh, cl uh, creating flow tools said, as soon as we have NFlow v9, we'll do some support for it. But it's not very clear what's going to happen. IP fix is somehow in the limbo. We don't know. I need this today. So that's why we have created. But mm -hmm. the problem is, what about the, the, rest, the rest of the features? I don't want to sell it. It's free, eh? and flow.org. Mm -hmm. But what about the payload? I would like to know in my network how many people are sharing MP3 files, or how many video files are sent to the internet. If you don't have the initial payload, you have no chance of knowing mm -hmm. it. Many people say, OK, peer-to-peer, -peer, we block it. But how can you block it? New protocols are smart and smart. If you don't dispatch the yes. initial payload, then you're in trouble. Also, as you, as you know, new protocols are encrypted, obfuscated, whatever. So this is a challenge. But I agree yeah. with you. Yeah, but, but, uh, just one remark. If you ask such a requirements for the IP fix, probably uh, they can somehow integrate your solution in the next uh, flow monitoring uh, Thing. This is what I've done, and so far I got no reply. Probably my email is wrong. <laughs> Let's see. Okay. It's very interesting and, uh, and quite elegant, but uh, w would you not have to add to the cost the, um, you know, the cost of uh, mirroring traffic on, on, a, on a gigabit port, which is not insignificant on, on let's say, a Juniper router? Yeah. I, I, I agree with you. Uh, it doesn't cost. But if you have a gigabit router, you have money, no? Don't you? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, but don't forget. Don't forget that the Juniper, in my, in my respect, it is free. Because if I have the network, I must have the router somewhere. So I don't have to pay for it. I have to pay for an additional peak. And this is true. This is true. OK, thank you very much again. Thank you.